You've got one file that's basically both of these talks together. It's got um, many slides in it. And uh, my normal speaking rate is kind of 80, 90 slides an hour. I've got kind of two hours to talk with you and there's more slides in that. So I'm gonna, there are times when I'm gonna skip over some of those to keep us on track. So at the end of this lecture, um, I really would like you to know a little bit of the basic history of CT, although I'm going to cut out some of that uh, in lieu of getting to some of the more salient points, uh, especially for kind of exam preparation. I want you to have a, a feeling for how reconstruction is performed. I want you to know some of the basics of the imaging parameters, uh, know some of the display information there. So let's just talk a little bit about tomography, right? Tomography really literally means slice imaging. Um, and really the idea here is we want to go from the planar x-rays uh, that were talked about here to these slice type images that were talked about, to what we were, we were uh, talking about when we talk about CT. You know, what were the limitations of those images back then? You know, I had a really poor quality x-ray tube, really poor quality film, no good collimation, scatter suppression, and all those things. So if you really look at the early history of x-ray imaging after 1895, a lot of it was devoted to kind of improving some of those things. But you know, even after that stuff was done, you still have the issue that on a planar radiograph, those 3D structures are all superimposed into a 2D image. So people really started to try and work on ways to minimize that effect. And this picture should look very familiar to you, right? Because I showed you a picture that looked like this when we talked about tomosynthesis. And right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because we were doing, quote unquote, tomosynthesis or conventional tomography going back 80 years ago. Basically, we rotated the x-ray tube and the film in concert with each other. And what you got was a single plane that was in better focus and the planes above and below that out of focus. Unlike today's digital technology, if I wanted a different depth of plane, I had to repeat the, po the process all over again using a slightly different fulcrum point. But what's nice with digital is we can do it one time and then just change the amount of shifting in the images when we add them together to get the different planes. So when I started residency back in 2001, 2002, we used to do a lot of intravenous pilograms, right? So we would take an image of the patient, we'd kind of guess how deep the kidneys were in the bottom, we'd do a tomogram, okay? You can think tomosynthesis uh, with a piece of film, and we'd look at that and say, yeah, the kidneys, were at about the depth of the kidneys there, go ahead and give them their contrast, and then we'd do our tomogram again to show that out. So these are some slice images, some conventional tomography type images that were done uh, before CT. How many people have a Panorex unit where they are? Another type of conventional tomography, right, where we rotate the x-ray tube and the imaging acquisition device together to get this image that has the plane of the mandible in good focus, the curved surface of that mandible, and the tissues deeper to that and superficial to that a little bit more out of focus. And of course, we also mentioned breast tomosynthesis. So those are types of kind of conventional tomography. In the early 60s, people started to think about, well, is, is there a way to do something better than to just, you know, have this limited arc and blur structures out? They're still there kind of in the way, even if they're blurred out a little bit better. And people really started to think about the mathematics of how to do that, how to reconstruct a cross-section of the image. And I want to introduce you to the concept of simple back projection, which was the first idea to do that. So imagine you have a, a round object, like a, let's say a cylinder, and you do a projection of that. So here's that projection, you know, it's like a, a line in an x-ray, if, if you will. And notice it's brighter in the center because the x-rays had to travel through a little bit thicker material and therefore were more attenuated and decreased on the edges. Well, now imagine if you took the projection image of that, the x-ray image of that, in this direction, and you also took it in this direction. Well, if I wanted to reconstruct a slice through that object, why don't I take this profile that I got here, remember, which is a little brighter in the center and drops off at the edges, and smear that back along the direction the x-ray was obtained. 
And then I'll do that for this projection as well. And we get some picture that looks like this. It doesn't really look anything like the original object. But, but let's take four projections. Now, instead of getting one to a pair 90 degrees apart, let's get one at uh, 45 degrees and then one over here at 135 degrees. And let's do that simple smearing back along the direction in which that occurred. Again, not looking a whole lot like the original object, but a little bit more so. And if we do that for more and more projections, notice when we get up to 32 or so projections here, we're starting to get something that looks a lot like that original object. Unfortunately, it still has this blurring in the background that decreases the con contrast in this slice image here. This is the notion of simple back projection. I want to apply it to a couple of objects so you get a better idea, something that's a little bit more complicated than that simple little round object that I showed you. Here's a mathematical phantom that's sometimes used to represent the brain. So imagine if we're taking a projection in this direction, right? And then that's the line of data that's represented here. And you'll notice this goes from zero to 180 degrees with one degree increment. So those are the, each line is the projection that you would take at each one of those degree increments. So here's the zero projection in that direction. When you get out here to where it's 90 degrees, that's the projection that's obtained in that direction. Now if you take each of those lines and you smear them back across a slice, right, smear them back, you get something that looks like that. Again, it looks like a very blurred version of that Shep Logan phantom. And that's the simple back projection. And again, the main problem with the simple back projection is that decrease in the contrast because of the fact that when we smear this back along the entire direction, it actually ends up putting stuff out here in the background where there's absolutely nothing in, in, the, in the true representation of the object. So how, how do we correct for that, right? Simple back projection basically produces a blurred image, a blurred slice image of the true object. And if we can understand the mathematical process behind the blurring, right, if we, we can correct for the blurring, and that's exactly what filtering does. Filtering is the correction that's applied so that when you do the back projection, the image turns out looking correct. So filtered back projection. We filter those projections and then we do the same thing. We just do that back projection of them uh, like we do. So let's look at that. So remember, here was that simple back projection. We had that original object that looked a little blurry. It turns out that the filtering means that we multiply this guy times, um, its, or at least its frequency do represent, do domain representation, and I won't get into that, but by this thing called a filter. And it changes the way that that object looks. Here's what the profile through that object looked like originally, right? We talked about the fact that it was most dense, if you will, in this region, so that's the highest peak, and then dropped off towards the edges. When you multiply that by the filter or apply the filter, convolve it with its filter if you want to be more mathematically correct, it ends up looking like this. Notice these negative side lobes on the edge of the object. That ends up canceling out that background stuff that we had that we knew shouldn't be there, okay? So that's, that's the object of that. So here is the filtered back projection with two projections. And if you notice with two projections, you probably would say to yourself, this sucks worse than the simple back projection, right? And it's really not until you get up to 64 projections or so that you notice you get a much sharper version of your original object, but it, it is in the background of a little bit of kind of uh, reconstruction noise. If you took this out to 128, 256, the mathematics behind the filtered back projection actually assumes that there, if you will, there is an infinite number of these projections to do that. So there's a little bit of artifact from that. So compare the filtered back projection to that simple back projected object. So that's what I want you to understand in terms of conceptually happening. That data that the CT scan acquires, those are the projections. And then we're going to take those and we're going to mathematically apply this filtering to them and then do the back projection. And that's going to give us our reconstruction for filtered back projection. Here's that Shep Logan phantom. Here's that, those projections, it's a, something called the sinogram, and here's that simple back projected object, and here's the filtered back projection version of that. And there's actually a couple here, because it turns out you can actually do filtering 
of the projections and then back project. So that's filtered back projection. But if you want, you can back project first and then filter. So you can do back projection filtering, but that typically isn't what's done. And it's just showing two examples of those. I wanted to give you a, a real, a little bit more of a real world example, right? So here is an original CT slice. So now if we theoretically were to take that and make our projection data and do a simple back projection of that, that's what the object would look like, right? You can tell maybe it's a slice of the body and you can see the vert vertebral body and some of the ribs there, but not much. And here it is, the filtered back projection image from that. And you can tell this was, must have been a, um, you know, a uh, mathematician or a physicist or someone who did this, right? Because they didn't care how they displayed the image. This patient's uh, got their spine, right, uh, anteriorly there. But it just conceptually gives you the idea between what simple back projection and filtered back projection are. Now, we're moving more and more to iterative reconstruction techniques away from filtered back projection. And the main reason for that is we can actually model the image formation process a little bit better and therefore do a little bit better handling of noise and those kind of things. And you may ask, well, why didn't we do that before, you know, the last five years or so? And the reason is that's computationally an extremely complex problem. Um, it, is, it takes a tremendous amount of computing power. The theoretic mathematics behind it aren't as complex as they are for filtered back projection, but the computational power that you need in terms of a computer to perform this are much more, uh, you need much more computational power. So I want you to think of your image as just being an array of, of values in a grid here. And of course the grid is much finer than I've even described here, 512 by 512 typically in CT. But in some ways, we can really think of this as a problem of, you know, multiple equations with unknowns, and we just need to solve those multiple equations. And I want to show you just briefly what I mean by that by doing our little four pixel example here, right? It's not going to be a very interesting problem with four pixels, but I think conceptually it will give you an idea, right? What do we do? We shine radiation of a known value across our object, which here I've drawn consisting of four pixels. We're only going to solve for it in terms of four pixels. And the amount of radiation that's going to pass through these two pixels and then hit our detector so I can measure the amount of uh, radiation that's incident on the detector. So I know how much was here and I know how much was there. I also know how wide these pixels are. And by the way, I could do a similar thing here. Incident radiation, which is probably the same as that amount, but the amount I detect may be a little different because these attenuation values here in this second row may be slightly different. So let's write an equation just for this top x-ray beam coming through and we detect it. So the amount that I detect is equal to the amount that comes in initially times e to the minus the thickness of the pixels and then those linear attenuation values, right? Remember, we talked about the fact that the X-ray beam intensity decays exponentially and the decay constants are the linear attenuation values. And these are the things that I want to plot. I want to make a picture of mu11 and mu12. So if you just take the log of both sides of those, I can now convert that to the log of these two values. That's just a number, right? Because we know both of those quantities. And that equals this guy in terms of our two unknowns. So I'm gonna change this. I know this looks a little messy here, right? So let's just call that some constant because it's really a value that we can calculate knowing the intensity going in and the intensity detected. So all I have is that C11 equals these two things. Well, I've got a known value here, and it equals the sum of those two unknown quantities. Right? Does everyone see that I could write a very similar equation for here? Right? I could write a very similar equation here. And then if I wanted to, so there's that other equation. If I wanted to, I could then rotate you know, 90 degrees and do the same exact thing again and get another equation here and another equation here. And very simply, right, I have four equations, four linear equations in four unknowns. And we all remember back to our algebra class where we had two equations and two unknowns and we had to solve them and we thought that that sucked. And then our teacher asked us to do three equations and three unknowns and we thought that sucked a lot more. And then they maybe taught us Kramer's rule or something to use matrices to try and sim simplify that. But, but um, 
you know, so this is a system of linear equations and unknowns. I mean, what's so hard about that? Yes, if you did it by hand, it's hard, but just put a, a computer to work on that. Each 512 by 512 CT slice contains 262,144 unknowns. Okay. Modern CT scanners acquire approximately 1,000 projections, right? Not just the two that I talked about to find our four unknowns, right? 1,000 projections. And there's about 750 detectors in a single row on the CT scanner, right? So I've got 1,000 times 750. That's 750,000 equations. Fortunately, I have more equations than unknowns, right? So, so I can solve that problem. But because of noise, those equations aren't even consistent with each other, right? So this is a tremendously challenging pro problem in terms of reconstruction, in terms of the computational power it takes. So what does iterative reconstruction do? It doesn't quite do exactly what we just talked about by solving those as a system of unknowns. Instead, it kind of says, well, what should the image look like? Let me use a guess to do that. Some, sometimes it actually uses something like filtered back projection as its initial guess. And it says, well, then let me take that guess of what the image should look like and let me compute what its projections would look like. What would the data on the detectors of the CT scanner look like if that was what the, Im the object looked like? And then it can compare those to the projection data that you got and look for what the difference is between those. And it can then use that difference to correct your estimation of the object. So basically, I went through all of this, but what I'm really saying is it says, well, let me start off with a guess of the image, and then I'm gonna calculate a correction factor, and I'm gonna correct that guess to give me a new image, and then I'll repeat this process. Well, how much does my new image match with the projection data. And if it doesn't, I'll cal calculate a correction factor and I'll update that image. And I'll continue to do this until my difference between my estimated projections from my image and the projections we measured is below some certain level. Okay, that's iterative reconstruction. Unfortunately, there's many variables that must be chosen as part of an iterative reconstruction. You know, how do we calculate that correction factor I kind of glossed over? When do you stop? How many iterations do you do before you stop? How do you use those projections to update the data? A lot of those things. And because of that, um, there are a lot of iterative reconstruction algorithms out there. You know, every manufacturer's filtered back projection algorithm basically does the same thing that, that I talked about. You can use slightly different filters, but their algorithm does the same thing. The iteratives are much more variable, so they're a little harder to talk about. We first used iterative reconstruction in nuclear medicine. Here, here's a, um, a cardiac study with really everything opened up so you can see the entire uh, uh, chest. Um, in this uh, woman. Um, but here's the number of iterations. One iteration, two, five, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100, 150. And you can see that as you continue to iterate, the data tends to get noisier and noisier. You tend to amplify noise as you iterate more and more. So you've got to know, you know, how do you pick your stopping point for this iteration process this is another important question as well. And oftentimes I'll ask people when I show this, you know, tell me, hey, which one of these images do you think is the best? And there'll be, there'll be quite a bit of variation. You know, some people will say we should stop at 10. Other people will say we should stop at 20. People usually mostly pick something that's in that middle row, though. So I said, told you that this is computationally much more demanding than filtered back projection. So then why are we using it? Well, because it has some certain advantages, right? It allows us to better model the physics of the projection back projection process. It allows us to better handle noise. Um, we can model some of the blurring uh, in the detector, uh, some of the resolution blurring there. Uh, we can better model the physics of that projector and back projector, and we can better handle some of the processes that actually occur, but filtered back projection assumes don't occur, like beam hardening and photon starvation and those kind of things. So 
iterative reconstruction here to stay? How many people in the room are using iterative reconstruction as part of their, uh, they've got, switched away from filtered back projection and all their body CTs are now being reconstructed iter iteratively. So we've got a, a few hands in the audience. My guess is if I ask that next year and the subsequent year, those percentages of hands are just gonna continue to go up. So we did a little brief historical introduction to tomography and its use in medical imaging. Um, I wanted to introduce for you so that you have kind of just a, a feeling for what simple back projection is and of course what filtered back projection is on top of that. And then kind of a, an idea of what iterative reconstruction is on top of that. So I, I would, next I really want to talk about the equipment. I want to talk about modern CT scanners and some of their components. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the generations of scanners, just really uh, to the point where they really get us to where we are today, if you will. We're going to go over some of the imaging parameters and the effects that they have on the type of quality image that we get. And, um, you know, understand a little bit about some of the modes of the scanner, including our um, topogram or, or a scout acquisition, operating in sequence mode, operating in helical or spiral mode, uh, fixed MA, dynamic MA, and fluoroscopic modes, if you will. So some major components, right? We've got that computer and we've really got that scanner. And so when we look in, here's that scanner. And a lot of times in a lot of setups, you'll often have two computers there. One will be kind of the acquisition computer that can do some basic reconstruction work. And then sitting next to that will be a workstation which can do some higher end work, some, perhaps some of your 3D uh, type display work. Although more and more, this is all coming packaged together in a single unit. You can use the, the acquisition CPU to do some of your 3D processing as well. If you take the housing off the CT scanner, this is what it looks like. Now, you can see this is the thing right here that's rotating around the patient, right? If you took the housing off and let it rotate at the three times revolutions a second that it rotates, there is no way any patient would lay down on the CT scanner, right? I mean, um, so the housing serves a very important role, right? Um, it requires a lot of power, right? CT scanner has a power consumption of about 200 kilowatts, and that power must be transmitted to this device rotating at three revolutions a second. That's where we are today, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we got there, because in a lot of ways, that's an engineering phenomenon in and of itself. Here's that power supply. You can see the big cables there coming into that power supply. We've got to have an x-ray tube um, that really can absorb a tremendous amount of heat and still fun function well. I mean, now we get these multi-phase studies and we cover, you know, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, you really, your tube has to be able to tolerate a tremendous amount of heating. And Unfortunately, the engineers have done a wonderful job there. I mean, I can remember my first day starting as a resident where we actually had to not use the CT scanner for a few minutes while the tube kind of cooled down. Now with these modern tubes, right, basically you could put a conveyor belt going into the CT scanner. I know sometimes in the emergency room it, it seems like that is what they're do doing. So there's that x-ray tube, and everyone sees the little window here that the x-rays are actually going to come out of. And so we've got that rotating cathode now, and notice that this is that evacuated tube, and we actually rotate the vacuum now. The seal here is so good, and we can pump in cooling oil to really keep this cool to prevent that heat damage from, from occurring. We use a little bit of added filtration in CT. Remember, part of the reason we lost contrast in x-ray imaging is because all the 3D structures were projected over each other. In CT, we're gonna improve our contrast just by the fact that we're no longer gonna have those superposition of 3D structures into a 2D plane. So we can actually get away with a little higher KV, right, and not get quite as much photoelectric effect there. Um, we try to still shape the beam a little bit, try to get a little bit more of a monochromatic peak to it, um, but, uh, you know, of course, you, we can only do that to a limited degree. One thing that's unique in CT is a bow tie filter that really helps shape the beam um, in terms of the, the quantity of that x-ray beam. It, of course, has a little bit of effect on quality as well as any filtration does. 
but it gives us a more uniform distribution of a noise in the patient, and frankly, it decreases the dose to the patient and reduces a bit of scatter. So I want to make sure that you, you guys understand that a little bit. I've, I think I've drawn this picture enough where we show that filtration kind of shapes that beam the way we, we would like it, and we tend to fil do a little uh, harder filtration in CT than we do in X-ray imaging. But because the body is either oval in shape or if you're scanning the head round in shape and frankly some of us are a little bit more round than oval. Um, you know if you take a look at the intensity of the x-ray beam as it exits the patient, x-rays up in this region have to travel through less tissue than x-rays through this tissue. So the number of x-rays, the, right, the intensity, the quantity of the x-ray beam is less here centrally than it is going to be up here just because of that. The beam here is going to be a little harder, so the average X-ray energy is going to be greater, but there's going to be fewer number of X-rays there. And that ends up with giving you a kind of an odd distribution of noise when you reconstruct uh, uh, the image. And so instead we apply this bow tie filter. And notice what that bow tie filter does is it filters out some of the lower energy X-rays to towards the end there, and now our central, um, and sorry, and then our we get fewer x-rays here, more towards the center where the filter is thinner, so that the net effect after it goes through the body is a more even distribution in terms of the number of x-rays. So that's the purpose of the bow tie filtering, one of the special types of filtration that we do in CT imaging. We also do a little bit of collimation, just like we would collimate in um, when we wanted to see something in, in fluoroscopy. Uh, this also shapes the beam a little bit. It turns out you can collimate in either the z-axis or the x-y-axis. You can do it pre or post-patient. Um, if you do it post-patient, you help eliminate some of the scatter hitting the detector, and that's uh, important if, uh, um, in some certain types of imaging. And the pre-patient co co collimation really reduces dose to the patient. So if you think about it, we'd really like to bring these pre-patient collimators in. You know, if our detector was only this wide, it, we should bring the pre-patient collimators in so that our x-ray beam is no wider than the detectors. It makes no sense to be irradiating parts of the patient that radiation isn't going, if that radiation isn't going to strike onto the detector there. And then we can bring these post-patient ones in sometimes, and that will eliminate some of the scattered radiation that might have been out of the primary beam field from actually striking the detector. The detectors are really the, the most expensive single component of a CT scanner, and there are a lot of different types. We mentioned some of the types, uh, older detectors, the old uh, volume zoom, and there's some of those, that four-row uh, Siemens detector still in use, used a xenon gas-filled detector. Most current uh, use, use a scintillating material, so you've got a, a crystal that scintillates, and then you've got a diode underneath that detects the intensity of the light that's given off, and it knows, it can calibrate that to the intensity of the x-ray beam that made it through at that point. Um, solid state detectors are in the development and so are some photon counting detectors. Remember those two things that we looked at when we talked about direct digital imaging in, uh, fluor um, in uh, radiography are also being developed for use in CT. And gas detectors, we've seen this image a number of times, very simple, x-ray comes in, uh, liberates uh, some electrons from the gas that fills that tube and those depart. And these detectors in the CT scanner are filled with xenon, right? You'd, we'd like to fill these with a high Z gas. So high Z, so we maximize the chance of them interacting. And we'd like to put them under pressure so we can increase the density of the gas that's in there and maximize the chance of interaction as well. And I've shown you guys a number of scintillators where that X-ray photon comes in and hits this, and then we have our light detection electronics underneath that. Let's talk a little bit about some of the generations of CT scanners, and I'm going to go through some of these fairly briefly and spend a little bit more time on others. So the first scanner, when uh, Sir Godfrey Hounfield made his first scanner, it had a parallel ray geometry. You, you basically had a pencil beam of X-ray, so a single X-ray beam, if you will, um, and it went in that uh, single X-ray beam, shined a line through your object, and hit this detector, and that intensity was measured. 
And then it translated over a little bit and it repeated that process. So we measured a single line of projection data, just a single line at a time. And then once we translated all the way through, we rotated and did that again, right? So this is like me showing you those simple uh, back projection images, right? Only it takes forever to get each one of these images. 4.5 minutes to scan one slice. And that's only getting 160 rays in each slice and going one degree apart before we repeat it. And the reconstruction took about a minute and a half. So we did this translate to acquire each line, rotate, and then start the process all over again. And there's his setup. The funny thing was he actually had a detector sitting below this one in the Z direction. So the first scanner was, if you will, a multi-row detector scanner, right, um, consisting of two rows. So the second generation simplified the problem by saying, hey, let's have, rather than a pencil beam, let's have a fan beam of a small number of rays, four or five of them or so, and that'll decrease the number of translations that we need to do. Now, some people thought, well, that's a little bit problematic in that each of these is now, now traveling straight across. It's at a slight angle. But it turns out if you limit that to just a few, four or five or so, the approximation that they were about the same as the parallel lines that we would get in the translation is close enough that this still works out very nicely. And using this, notice they were able to speed things up a little bit, right? Now we could do about 18 seconds to scan one slice or so. So in the third generation, we got rid of that translation need, right? We increased the number of detectors to around the 750, 800 that it is today. They're all located on a kind of a curved surface in kind of a fan configuration. It's enough to kind of give you the, the entire patient can be included in the field of view. And then we joined the tube and the detector together mechanically, so now we could just basically rotate. There was no need for the translation motion. All the mathematics that had been described, de developed, to do reconstruction using filtered back projection assumed that the acquired projections were parallel to each other. But now, does everyone see, right, we're acquiring this broad fan-type projection. And so one of the things that had to happen in order to to go from this parallel beam projection process, which was quite slow, to this fan beam acquisition, was the realization that you had the same data sets. It's just that they were organized completely differently. And I want to show that to you by showing you this picture. Does everyone see, here I've got two positions where we've done our fan beam acquisition, a few degrees apart from us. We've rotated over a little bit here to get the one that I've labeled in blue compared to yellow. Now I'm going to start to subtract some of the rays from this, some of the projection lines away from both of these, okay? So let's start to subtract some of those out. And does everyone see that there are a pair of lines in these two projections which are parallel to each other? And if you rotate entirely around the, the body, if I did this at a third spot and color-coded that red, I could keep one of my red lines, which was parallel to these ones. And if I did that at the next position, there would be. And so really all you needed to do was take the fan data and do what we call re-bin it, resort it, into all the rays that were parallel to each other and do, then do your filtered back projection on that. So it took that kind of leap of faith. And really, this is what our modern scanners do with one exception. At some point, we decided we were gonna move the X-ray table while we were rotating. We were gonna go to a helical acquisition or a spiral acquisition. But before that happened, a couple of other things were introduced. Here was the fourth generation CT. You just made a complete row of detectors. Um, this is nice because when I showed you that rotating gantry, uh, you know, the detector and the x-ray tube in combination that are rotating, they're way over 2,000 pounds. We certainly don't tell the patient that when we, you know, put them in the, the bore of the scanner and rotate it three times a second, right? So if I no longer have to rotate the detector and can just rotate the tube, I actually can actually get the speed of that rotation a bit higher. I've got less mass that I'm having to rotate around. 
But what did I tell you about the detectors? They're the most expensive part of the CT scanner, right? So the problem with this is rather than having 72 degrees of detectors, you've now got 360 degrees of detectors you have to pay for. So that kind of fell by the wayside. Here was the fifth generation of scanners. This was um, electron beam tomography, where now I bring my electrons in and I actually fire them uh, to strike these targeting rings, and I can steer them. These targeting rings actually go around the patient 180 degrees, and I can steer my electrons to go hit them at different points. So now in electron beam tomography, I didn't even have to rotate an X-ray tube around the patient. And this was popular for a while in kind of the mid-90s because you could do a very fast acquisition with this. So for cardiac imaging, it was really the first scanner that was utilized for doing that. But again, it's extremely expensive. And so this really got replaced with this sixth generation of CT, helical or spiral CT. Um, you know, those previous scanners operated in sequence mode. In other words, the X-ray tube and detector rotated 360 degrees around the patient, then they stopped. The table shifted forward a small increment, then they rotated back the other direction. Table shifted forward again, they rotated in the other direction and continue to do that. And part of the reason for that was you had these really heavy duty power cables connecting to the x-ray tube and connecting to the detectors, although those don't have to be the same kind of power requirements. And so you couldn't continue to just rotate the tube in one direction. If you did, you'd wind those cables up and, and rip them apart. So someone had to come up with a way to allow that to continuously spin, but still maintain high quality, high power electrical connections with those devices. And that's the slip ring technology uh, that we see today. So here's the old right, just continue to rotate and move the table forward, which is what the tube did. It only did that on the older versions, right? Rotated 360, then the table shifted in an increment. Now we're gonna move the table continuously while the tube continues to rotate, and we end up getting, tracing this kind of helical path, if you will, of X-ray energy through the patient. Here's that technology that had to, to exist in order to make that happen. Does everyone see this big center cylinder of metal that's here? And these are the electrical connections. They're actually little pads that fit in these grooves here. And I'm gonna show you those up close. He, well, here it is up close. And here is stepping further back away from that. So these are all the electrical contacts that are made through there. And they're made with this device. It, you can see that this, um, it, this is almost like a, uh, a coil spring, right, uh, um, uh, that you might see on, a, uh, on an old uh, car suspension, right, and so it forces them up to main con maintain contact with those rings. So that slip ring technology allowed you to maintain contact with that moving portion of the scanner without having cables con directly connected to it. The seventh generation just now added multiple rows to the detectors, right? We first ended up had single row helical scanners. Now we started to look at multi-row detector helical scanners. Um, and, you know, there are some more issues. We talked about the interpolation problems with fan beam. Now we've got helical scanners, so we're not the data that we acquire isn't all exactly in that one slice like it would be for the sequence acquisition, right? And so you can't move the table as fast as you might like to move it. If you move it too fast, your reconstruction quality is gonna suffer from that. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the concept of pitch. But when we added multiple rows to the scanner, it allowed us to travel the Z distance that we traveled per one rotation of the scanner got greater. And so we could scan through the patients even quicker with that uh, generation. So here we are looking, we've got our individual detectors in any one given row. I've already mentioned the fact there's about 750 of these that span a 72 degree arc. And then the first scanners started out with two rows and then quickly we went to four and then 
This is happening while I was a resident in the early 2000s. So the next thing I know, we have a 16-row detector scanner, and the next thing I know, we have a 64-row detector scanner, and then a 128, and um, you know, now there are scanners, uh, gosh, that have, have, have many more than that. So here's the Siemens Volume Zoom, the four-row detector scanner that was out at the time. You could actually combine these rows in all sorts of different ways, but once you went to scanners that had you know, multiple rows in the 64s, the 256s, the 320s, um, all of those detector rows really became equal in width because re, um, you know, having them be variable widths really didn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. So this is the, the range that they cover along that z-axis. So if you have a 128-row detector and each of the um, rows is, or let's go with the 64-row detector, and each of the rows is 0.6 millimeters, that's that Z coverage of those rows is a couple of centimeters or so. So it's still not a lot, right? It's a, a one-inch band uh, craniocaudal on the patient that we're covering with that. Um, cone beam CT tries to extend that, right, to really now make the coverage in the Z axis about as wide, as it, if you will, as it is in the X and Y axis. Um, here that is, right, instead of getting this one detector row or maybe there's, you know, 32 or 64 of those, now we frankly have like a huge flat panel detector and we just are rotating that around the patient. This, this brings about some additional interesting reconstruction problems. The mathematics of some of the reconstructions become more complicated when we do this, and I don't want to get into that here, but towards the ends of this cone beam where the data is angled quite a bit more as it, than it is towards the center, you end up not sampling the tissues quite the same, and so there's some, some issues that you have to work with in terms of the, the reconstruction. And you can see that here, right? Here's the central slice. You know, if you only have three or four rows, or maybe if you're even only covering what, what did we say, one inch or a couple of inches in the Z direction, this off-axis angul angulation of the acquisition planes is not really that severe. But as you try to go to maybe 30 centimeters in that plane, it becomes uh, quite a, a bit of uh, angled plane acquisition. The, the next generation, although frankly people stopped calling these different generations basically at about this point, was the dual source scanner where we had two separate x-ray tubes. And you could really use this dual source configuration to do some very different things. If you wanted to, you could apply the same KV to both x-ray tubes and really just rotate this thing, well, move your table even faster because notice you'd have two pieces of detector material here. So instead of sampling 72 degrees. Turns out they're not both 72 degrees. The one detector is a little smaller than the other. I'm actually sampling a greater arc of data, so that allows me to, with each revolution, so now I can move the patient through even faster. So one thing is you can use that for speed. And in cardiac imaging, in fact, that's what we do. The dual source scanner really becomes the cardiac imaging workhorse in a lot of places. But another thing you can do is set them at different KV and use some of that differential attenuation information we talked about uh, tissues, right, that tissues attenuation is different, different x-ray energies, and we can use that to do material comp decomposition. Um, so some we use for speed, that gives us really nice, um, you know, multiplanar uh, curve, multiplanar reformats for doing stuff like looking cardiac vessels. Here's a study for renal stone where, you know, this, the, this uh, uric acid stones are color-coded red because based on the two different KVs on the x-ray tube and knowing what the Hounsfield unit measure for each pixels are on that two data sets, we can figure out what pixels are composed of calcium and which ones are composed of uric acid. We do the very similar thing in gout imaging in MSK, only for whatever reason in MSK we, co we color code uric acid green, while Siemens set up co color codes it red on their, uh, y you know, uh, renal stone dual energy uh, protocol thing, but it's really doing the same thing. It's, it's asking where, where do those paired Hounsfield units at the two energies fall and using that to type what type of material you have. 
So let's talk some about some of our imaging parameters now that we have under our control and how we're gonna utilize them in the setting of modern CT scanners uh, to do that. And I really, with the setting of modern CT scanners, I think probably most of us in the room are most familiar with having a uh, seventh generation scanner, right? A multi-row detector uh, helical acquisition scanner. So what I'm gonna talk about is really gonna be most applicable to that. So the, the first thing that we need to decide is, right, when we acquire our data set, since we have this helical acquisition, I can actually ask for a slice to be reconstructed at any particular position I would like in the body. I can ask you to make a slice for me. And what you're going to really do is you're going to take the portion of the helix, the data set from the helix that is in that vicinity, and you're going to use that data to reconstruct that slice. I can specify how thick I want that slice to be. Basically what I'm specifying there is how much of the helix of data do I want you to utilize to reconstruct that, right? If, the, if I say the slice is five millimeters in thick, well I may have the, the ribbon of the helix that actually wraps around that five millimeters a couple of times and I'll use all that data to make this reconstruction. Um, and then I can specify how far apart I want these slices to be. So if you ask your tech to give you five by fives, right, that means you want five millimeters thick and you want them spaced five millimeters apart. And that means there'll be no gap between them, right? Or you can ask them to give you three by threes, three millimeters thick, three millimeters apart. There'll be no gap between them. Occasionally we do some imaging where we ask for gaps, like maybe in a high resolution chest CT, right, we're gonna get fairly thin slices, but we're, not, we're gonna get them one centimeter apart, right, or something. But more and more in today's age, we don't use gap a, a whole lot. As a matter of fact, a more common thing to do is to have a little bit of overlap between these. So I may ask the tech to give me three by twos. Give me three millimeter thick slices, two millimeters apart to give me a little bit of overlap. Because it turns out if I want to do multi-planar reformatting, those images will actually look better if I've got a little bit of overlap between the two. So when we ask for a slice thickness for different applications, we, we usually ask for different things. If I need some high resolution imaging, like chest, Right? I'm looking at the lung parenchyma here. I'm going to ask for fairly thin slices. And of course, I'm going to use a reconstruction filter that's better suited to that. It gives, preserves high resolution for me. That filter that's used in filtered back projection, can, I can use one that gives me a little bit higher resolution, or I can use one that gives me a little bit lower resolution. The trade-off is the higher resolution has, is a little noisier. The lower resolution one has less noise associated with it. So for this chest task, where I want to look at the lung parenchyma, I really like to use right at those nice thin slices. And when I also often have the tech send us a maybe three millimeter thick uh, slice for, to look to evaluate soft tissues, reconstructed with a slightly different uh, kernel and also windowed slightly different as well. And we'll talk about those. I just show these because I want to remind you, right? If we want to do some multiplanar reformatting. Right, or some volume rendering. I really need thin slices to start with. And you want to remember to, if you're gonna go to make some of these, then you need to ask for those. If you have the tech reconstruct five millimeter slices and then the raw data gets thrown out, you can't make these images look like this after that fact, right? So here's a nice coronal, coronal multiplanary format. It's just taking a, the axial 2D data set that was reconstructed in nice thin slices and reformatting it, right? It, it, there's no new filtered back projection that's gone. It's just taking that volume of data and cutting through it a different way and displaying it. What do we call this image? This is a maximum intensity projection image. It's a, uh, the slab looks fairly thick, a fairly thick slab MIP where the maximum value is done here. What is this one? This is a MINEP, right, the minimum intensity uh, proje projection here where the lowest valued pixel uh, gets displayed for this one. And this is a volume rendered image, and uh, we'll look at some of those. These are some shaded surface representations that we can make where now you almost have to, your image is created such that there's an 
artificial light source that's being shined on the object. And, and not only do you say when you, the pixel goes through, your, your ray goes through and strikes an object of a certain density, that light now kind of reflects back at you, what would that image look like? It's an artificially created representation of that referred to as a, a shaded surface display. Here's a shaded surface display of a hip. And this is the same hip, this is the volume rendering. In the volume rendering, we actually let that uh, line kind of continue to extend through like it would on an x-ray, and we ask each pixel along the path to contribute to the intensity that we show in the image. So notice on the volume rendering, you can see this screw that's buried beneath the bone surface, while on the shaded surface, where all we actually see is the surface of objects, we don't recognize, we don't see that that screw is there. In CT, we almost always reconstruct on a 512 by 512 pixel matrix, right? MR uses usually kind of 256 by 256 up to 512 by 12, but frankly, that's, that's quite variable in MR. We can, we can vary it quite a bit. Remember our chest x-rays, right? 2,500 by 2,000 or so. So we have nowhere near the resolution of a chest x-ray. Um, CT, the pixels are three times larger than they are there. But in CT, our field of view, our reconstructed field of view determines our in-plane resolution. And I think I tried to show this. So, so here's an axial reconstruction of a wrist in a patient who is able to put their wrist out straight forward along the z-axis of the scanner. So we brought down the field of view, right, to about 10 centimeters, and so if we want to calculate what the resolution is per pixel, well, we take the 512, and we take the 10 centimeters, sorry, and divide by the 512 pixel, and we get about 0.2 millimeters per pixel, okay? And I want you to see, understand how important this is, right? Pretty good quality image of that wrist there. By the way, reconstructed with a high resolution filter or kernel for bone and displayed with bone window settings that we'll look at in a second. <clears throat> Here's a patient who couldn't extend their arm out because they're in a splint. And so they had their arm not along the z-axis, but almost perpendicular to the z-axis, okay? And so notice now the tech, when they reconstructed, their reconstruction field of view is much larger. And it's more kind of in that sagittal plane rather than in that axial plane. So they then had to go ahead and create me some axial reformats that I'll show you in a second. But here we've got 25 centimeters, so now we take that 25 divided by 512, and our pixel, our resolution is half a millimeter per, per pixel, right? Two and a half times worse than in that other view. And if I display these images, you can see that. Now, they're, they're, they're windowed slightly differently. They're both kind of a bone windowing, but this one's got a slightly different bone window on it. Notice that these axial images had to be reformatted from that data set that was acquired kind of sagittally. And now I'm gonna blow this up so that this wrist is about this same size. Because remember, these pixels were much smaller than, than that. So, so there they are. Does everyone see how much better our resolution is by getting good positioning on the CT scanner and then reducing our reconstructed field of view to the size of the object that we wanted to see. I want you to understand that concept and how that works. And we'll utilize that sometimes, right? Sometimes when you'll see a pulmonary nodule and you're not sure if it's calcified or not, ask your tech to go back and get you reconstruct that area in a smaller field of view. And sometimes it'll help you identify some uh, uh, pixels, some calcium within that, that'll allow you to definitively call a nodule um, benign. We talked a little bit about beam quality, right, the quality of our x-ray beam. Um, that was really kind of the average energy, and we said that usually falls in kind of the one-third to one-half range of the maximum energy. And I want to emphasize one point we talked about, right? If you increase MA, or if you increase MAS, right, you increase the number of x-rays produced. You increase the quantity of the x-ray beam, you have no effect on the quality of the x-ray beam. If you increase KV, you increase both the quality and the quantity of the x-ray beam because you increase the number of x-rays that are produced. The higher the KV, the more efficient the production of x-rays. Remembering our equation, right? KV 
times the z of the material, for us that's almost always gonna be tungsten, times 10 to the minus six gives you a rough approximation of your efficiency for x-ray production. So as kV goes up, you're gonna make more x-rays of every energy, okay? Filtration, we talked about over and over again, right? Increases uh, beam quality, but it decreases its quantity. It decreases the number of x-rays at all energies. So what happens as we adjust tube current? So here I've got a water phantom, right? A water phantom. And um, in the morning when the tech does quality control on your CT scanner, they put a water equivalent or a water phantom out there and they, they do an image of it. And does anyone know when they draw that ROI in there, where does that mean value of Hounsfield units have to lie as part of that quality control check? Does anyone know? You know, plus or minus seven Hounsfield units, right? It should be zero, water should be zero, but plus or minus seven or so. Well, if you drive the MA way down, notice KV stays the same at uh, 120, they're driving the MA way down. Here we're at 10 MA or so. Notice how much noisier that image gets. You can see that the mean Hounsfield units are still in that close to zero range, but the standard deviation is getting much higher. So changing the tube current has a substantial impact on the noise that we have in the image, and of course has an impact on the dose to the patient, right? The dose to the patient here is much higher than it is here. Here's tube voltage, and I'm, I'm not sure how, how well the, all of this projects. So here we've gone from 80 kV here to 100 kV to 120 kV to 140. Those are usually the four settings that you're allowed on most modern CT scanners. Here's the image noise level, okay? And everything is re relative, to, they're using for some of these numbers, the percentages relative to 120. So notice going to 140 results in a 17% decrease in noise. That's because you produce more x-rays when you increase that kV, right? And at 100, the noise is 42% higher than at 120. At 80, it's 74% higher than at 120. And of course, the CT dose index, something we're gonna talk about a little bit, which is a measure of the dose to the patient. Of course, as we go from 120 to 140, notice how significantly it increases. It increases almost 50%, right? Drops 40% and going from 120 down to 100, drops 48% uh, going down to, 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 to 80 right there. And I wanna say one thing though, right? These are all obtained with a, a constant tube current of around 200 MA, okay, around 200 MA. Remember, most of our modern CT scanners will adjust the MA to try and keep a, a, a certain level of noise in the image. In other words, you specify an MA effective that you would like for that particular scan. These are done just varying KV, leaving everything else constant. All right. So I want to mention a little bit about pitch. The word pitch has changed over time, and thus if you read books or read the literature, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. And that has to do with when we first introduced uh, helical scanning, there was only a single row of detectors. And so pitch had to do with how wide that single row of detectors were compared to how far the uh, table of the CT scanner traveled during a single rotation. When we went to multi-row detector CT scanners, there now became two ways to define pitch. You could define it in terms of the width of a single row of your detector, or you could define it in terms of the overall width of all the rows combined. And that's when you're reading, sometimes it's a little confusing as to which one of those terminologies they may be using. So hopefully that's helped clarify um, that sometimes they're the term is used differently and you can just keep an eye out for that as you're reading a, reading a source. So slicer detector pitch, which is really applicable to those older days, right? We look at the distance that we end up traveling, right? And, and we divide that distance uh, by the width of a single slice on the, the scanner. And so long as the, the distance that we travel um, isn't greater than, uh, the, the, we don't travel more than twice the distance of the width of the slice, uh, then we can make a, a high quality reconstruction. When we talk about beam pitch, or frankly in modern literature, which is what is just called pitch now, 
we're really talking about the entire width of all of the detector rows together. So we take that distance traveled in one rotation and we divide by the width of all of those detectors. And again, if we don't travel more than twice that width, we can get a high quality reconstruction. If we travel more than twice W in ro one rotation, in other words, if pitch is greater than two, then our quality of our reconstruction is gonna suffer, okay? So the word pitch, uh, I think I've beaten like a dead horse. I'm just gonna say the concept that you need to know is simple. If in one rotation, the table travels more than twice the width of the detectors, then our image quality is gonna suffer. So we wanna make sure that pitch stays less than two. Lower pitch is slower, so if you notice studies where we like need to get through the entire chest in a, very quickly, we, we get that pitch up close to two, right, because that'll allow us to move things very quickly. The downside is that the higher pitch goes, you do lose a little bit of your resolution in the z-axis direction, right? The, the faster the thing is moving, it makes sense that your resolution isn't going to be quite as good in that direction. Um, <clears throat> if the pitch is less than one, it implies oversampling. So now our, our ribbon of our helix, they actually overlap each other a little bit. And so that results in increased radiation dose to the patient. We typically don't have pitch than less than one. Uh, and uh, there are sometimes times when it's helpful to have pitch slightly less than one, maybe 0.8 or so. so. And we can reconstruct any infinite number of images provided that helical raw data set is present. You can tell me a particular slice at which you want to reconstruct something in the patient, and we could ask the tech to reconstruct it right at that spot. So our acquired slice thickness, though, can't be any narrower than the width of the detector. Right? That, that should make sense. Even if we were operating in sequence mode, where we rotated 360 degrees around the patient without moving the table, right? the, the slice that I sampled is the width of the detector. I, it makes no sense to try and reconstruct slices that are thinner than that. There is a temptation in this day and age because we've got these multi-row detector scanners with 0.6 millimeter detectors to just acquire everything with the thinnest possible slices. But, but realize, right, if you want really thin slices with high image quality, that requires higher dose. And so really think about what is necessary for the particular CT application you're doing don't acquire slices at 0.6 millimeters if they're of no clinical use to you. You're just really insisting on a certain higher level of dose to the patient. Okay? Here are some images. <clears throat> Notice we're, we're going here from thinner slices to thicker, and the changes are subtle. Does everyone see some of the partial volume effect that's occurring where structures in and out of the plane are now being um, uh, incorporated into what we see in this pericardial fat. Does everyone see that here? Much sharper here on this thinner slice. As we get thicker, we get more of that volume averaging. Notice if you look in the fat, the speckling in the fat and, and some of the areas here, notice how much that gets reduced here because of the noise, right? If we use thicker slices, we're using data from more x-ray acquisitions to make the reconstructed image, and our noise is determined by the number of x-rays that we actually have used for the data set. We, I've already mentioned that MPR is that 2D technique, right? And if we want to make those, like these coronal multiplanar reformats, I really need to have data that was acquired nice and thin. See all this stair-step artifact on these right here. I mentioned the fact that if you do a little overlap, you can actually make for more artifact. And I'm trying to remember exactly how these were done. I think these were in the order of two, three millimeters. These were done like threes every two. These are threes done every three. And does everyone see you still have a little bit of the stair step, but if you provide a little overlap, even with the same slice thickness, it gives a nice smoothing to the data set there. We, I have already mentioned the acquired slice thickness. You know, here's some of these modern scanners with up to 320 rows of detectors, each measuring kind of